Welcome back to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at a kind of infamous class from AD&D 1st Edition out of the Player's Handbook, The Assassin. It's a thief subclass and uh, actually didn't make the cut as the uh, AD&D transited from 1st to 2nd Edition. So we're going to go into the class itself. I'll talk a little bit about why it wasn't included initially in 2nd Edition and when it eventually made its way back. So today on page 121, we'll look at the Assassin from the Player's Handbook. Also, subscribers. Yeah, why not? Come on in. I thank my subscribers. Thank you, everybody who has subscribed. Uh, there's still plenty more people out there that haven't. Come on in. Let's keep the channel growing. Also, uh, patrons, my patrons, thank you. I appreciate the support. I've got an active uh, rewards going for Patreon right now. So take a look and see if it's anything you're interested in. So that's it for the commercial. Back to the important stuff at hand. Assassins from the Player's Handbook for AD&D 1st Edition. Okay, the Assassin. Uh-oh. The Assassin, my goodness. Yep, the Assassins were interesting. They are a thief subclass. And oddly enough, my, my most successful character was in fact an Assassin. Uh, he was neutral evil. But uh, he had kind of learned very early in his, ga his gaming life to not make waves. He would pretend to be a thief. He would act as a thief, but he would always be honest with the party, and he would never steal from the party. He didn't want to make waves because he didn't want anybody, you know, throwing him out of the party or some paladin deciding he had to come after him or whatever. And uh, so my assassin was around, he's been around since November of 1980, and is... Uh, so powerful now that he's more or less an NPC. I rarely play him. I rarely play as a player anymore, but I rarely play that character in particular. The Assassin, as I said, is a subclass of the, the Thieves, and you have to be, have to have a minimum strength of 12, an intelligence of 11 or more, and a dexterity of not less than 12, and you never gain bonus experience points for having high-level stats. So assassins actually go up slower than most of other classes. Just as do thieves, assassins get six siders for hit dice. Uh, they are evil in alignment. Um, that we changed a little bit. I had a player who was a massive fan of James Bond books and films. And he said, okay, uh, Bond's not evil. And I said, okay, that's, that's a valid point. You can make a, certainly make a valid point that Bond is neutral, not evil. And... Uh, so I said, okay, here's the deal. I allow you to have a neutral assassin, but you have to give me the backstory as to why this particular assassin is neutral. Otherwise, the evil rule is still in place. I think he, only he ever played a neutral assassin. I think everybody else just went with the rule of evil. By the way, I do allow my game, I do allow uh, good and evil to mix as long as everybody's kind of behaving themselves and unless there's an overt reason why good has to deal with something in the evil uh, or knows about the evil. Uh, I don't make a big thing of it. Um, it all depends in our game more on behavior than your actual alignment. Uh, uh, thieves have, or assassins can use any kind of weapon, any kind of shield, which is pretty nice. Uh, they, or they can use a shield, rather, and they can use any kind of weapon, so they're better than thieves in combat, generally. Uh, kind of go ahead and zoom in a little bit there. Okay. An, an assassin character doesn't have to be a member of the Assassin's Guild, uh, which is explained a little bit below. It's basically the group that oversees the assassinations, where you get your work from. Uh, assassin's Guilds are great. Uh, you, you can play a player who, or a character who is not in the guild, especially if they're moving around in Greyhawk. Uh, if you're in the Greyhawk City Assassin's Guild and you're adventuring over in Almor, you're not going to join the Almorian uh, Assassin's Guild. You're just going to show your bona fides from the Greyhawk Assassin's Guild. That's pretty much how we play it. And that's never really been an issue in our game. The primary function of Assassins is killing. They can use poison. And then there's a chance when you have poison on your weapon, there's a chance that people looking on will have to see that uh, you have a poison weapon. I don't think I've ever used those rules. Then we come down to a big area of disagreement on assassins. Assassins attack on the same table as thieves do, including backstabbing. However, if they surprise a victim, they may attack on the assassination table. 
and this gives them roughly a 50% chance of killing a, a, a victim. It's all dependent on the victim level. If this fails, normal damage according to weapon type and strength the ability modifier still accrues to the victim. Thus, if a poison weapon is used, the victim must also save versus poison or die. The assassin decides which attack mode he or she will use, assassination, backstabbing, or nor normal melee combat. We changed this. It occurred to me that you were backstabbing to do the assassination. You're backstabbing when you do a backstab attack. So what we allow is if you don't make your assassination roll, we still allow the multiplier for backstab. Simply because you hit him somewhere, you just didn't get him in a vital organ that you were aiming for. You, you slightly missed. But since damage accrues normally, and you would be allowed the option of a back attack, and getting a back attack, frankly, is not all that easy in the game, uh, we allow that if you blow the assassination roll, you still get the multiple damage. Now, there are a lot of modifiers on the assassination and backstab rule in our game. The... Uh, to assassinate something, you have to know its anatomy. So I'm going to use a, an, um, well, let's use a golem, for instance, which has no real anatomy per se. You can't, by definition, assassinate a golem. For one thing, they're not alive. For another thing, they have no vital organs. Could you backstab a golem and do multiple damage? We say yes. You get the golem in what would be, you know, the back of its knee or the, the small of its back or something. You can mess up some of its mobility. So we do allow the, the backstabbing multiplayer against the golem, but you cannot assassinate it. We also don't allow you to assassinate huge things such as giants and especially dragons. If it's a creature like a bugbear and you've never encountered it before, we allow you to get the multiplier for your backstab damage, but we do not allow assassination on that creature until you've actually studied the anatomy. You have to learn where the organs are and such. I realize that that might seem a little counterintuitive, but I found it added a nice layer to the assassin because the assassins in my campaign after they which by the way there have only been a handful maybe five in all the time i've run ad and d uh including my guy uh but if i found that the assassin when they find out they have to study the anatomy will actually take the time and study the anatomy so you'll have an encounter that'll finish up but the assassin's going to linger for a couple of hours learning how this creature's laid out um that just adds a nice level of I don't know, it just adds a nice level of role-playing to the game for me. On that same point, I've had a, a th thief, or an assassin rather, ask me, hey, I'm going to study the dragon's anatomy so I can assassinate it next time I meet a dragon. My answer to that is no. Uh, your weapon compared to its organs, are, it, your weapon's too small, you can certainly hurt it, but you're not going to kill it. I'm not going to let you flat-out assassinate a dragon or just assassinate a uh, big giant or anything like that. Uh, I pretty much top out around, uh, say, ogre size would be the, the biggest creature I would just allow somebody to flat assassinate. And then there's even exceptions there, like a troll, who is basically just sinew and bone and regenerates like crazy. Vital organs aren't that vital to them, therefore I don't allow trolls to be assassinated. They can get the double damage from the backstab, or double, triple damage, whatever it is, but I don't allow a flat assassination for them. So that's enough of that. Primary abilities of assassins which enhance their function are those of being able to speak alignment languages and being able to disguise as follows. And uh, it allows you assign alignment languages, but since I don't use alignment languages in my game, I just allow that, that the player with the right stats gets to go ahead and pick other actual languages, Elvish if they don't speak it, Orc, anything like that. And then at 13th level, with an 18 intelligence, they'd be able to maximize this with four other languages, not alignment languages, although I do allow them to use Thieves' Cant. I don't allow them to learn Druidic. Disguises can be donned and you, you while you're wearing your disguise. Uh, if you're with a party for a long time and you're posing as um, some kind of innocuous, you know, you're posing as a cleric, there's a 2% chance per day of the people that are in your immediate orbit that they'll notice something inconsistent with your behavior or your, your uh, disguise, and then they'll be able to uh, say, say, hey, something's not right here, and maybe they'll, they'll catch on that you're an assassin. I like this guy's a lot. I use it a lot when I play my assassin. Uh, he has several aliases. Uh, his name is Kirk. He has gone by Clark, of course spelled K-L-A-R-K, -K, and Kirok, which anybody who's watched the original Star Trek knows was a name Kirk went by 
in uh, an episode of the, the series. So I've used, and then of course, my first alias, when I was first brand new, I was introduced to the party as the uh, thief Spock. So I've used a lot of different aliases with the character. Um, everybody at my table knows Kirk quite well, uh, and they know. I play Kirk as what I call corporate evil. He goes where the money is. He doesn't really care how he gets the money, but he wants the money. So he's not out there just killing things for killing's sake. He wants to make a profit. Therefore, he'll work and he'll be a good boy if he has to, as long as there's a profit to be had at the end. And then we get into following the uh, assassins. Uh, we find out that the functions of assassins are the same as thieves. They have all the abilities and functions of thieves, but except for backstabbing, assassins perform two levels below the assassin. So a third level assassin has the abilities of a first level thief. That is a lot because you get the old, uh, you get to read scrolls and, and stuff like that when you get to be 12th level. That can add a lot of power to your assassin. And let's see. Now we go toward the infamous stuff. Uh, you, first off, you can't have hirelings until about 12th level or 4th level. And at 8th level, you can gain a few more. Uh, in order for assassins to get experience above 13th, you must have the experience points and then assassinate the local guild master to go to 14th. And then to go to 15th, you have to have the experience points and wipe out the guild master, the grandfather of assassins in the area. Neither one is an easy thing to do. My character, Kirk, did make grandfather of assassins after about a two-year game. Uh, back about 20 years ago, where he meticulously planned out eliminating his rival for the uh, to be the guildmaster and then ultimately the grandfather. Uh, he has ruled since, and there have been a few challenges to his rule, but nobody's ever made it. Uh, and then the headquarters of the guild is always a large uh, city or a big town, but the headquarters for the grandfather can be some remote area on a countryside or whatever. So that can be a lot of role-playing, and that's going to take a lot of work on the DM's part to really work with the assassin once he gets up in those levels. But once he hits 15th level, he's done. My character has not progressed in level in 20 years. Now, I have not played him that much, but he would be up several, eh, probably at least two more levels, uh, if I were able to progress in levels. And one of the things we keep talking about is, is expanding this table to let a grandfather of assassins become a great-grandfather or something like that. So we're, we're still uh, talking about that, but since they, I'm the only one with an assassin who's that high level, it's never really been much of an issue at our table. Uh, and like I say, I play him so infrequently. I play him once about every two years, and it might be in a one to three night game. Usually my friend Craig will run a game for me to have a little break and be a player, and a lot of times I'll choose to run one of my high levels. And the last time we did it about two years ago, I chose Kirk, and I played him for a couple of games. Now... In the real world, the Assassin class was dropped from AD&D 2nd Edition as part of the Satanic Panic. The inclusion of an evil class, specifically one that made money by wiping out other sentient creatures, was viewed as being not a good thing for the game. Uh, the, uh, the optic was bad for the game. So ultimately, the class was dropped. It was brought back in the Scarlet Brotherhood module, uh, super module that was done as second edition in the late 90s, I think 99. Uh, it was brought back into, or brought into second edition, rather, uh, in that module. And the rules are fine. It, it's its own class, then it's not a subclass of Thief and stuff. And I, I've never played an Assassin that way. But it was nice that it got included back in once the Satanic Panic had started to die down. And of course, by the advent of third edition, that all that nonsense was pretty much done. Uh, if you don't know the Satanic Panic, it was when a bunch of people decided that anybody who played AD&D was getting together and devil worshipping and casting spells on each other and causing harm to each other, and it had to be stopped. And it was led by a woman who's, who had some unfortunate uh, outcomes from her, her son playing AD&D. I'm not going to go into the details on that. You can look it up. Uh, but it was um, largely by people that didn't know the game and didn't understand it. Uh, and the media made kind of a big deal out of it. But then the, all the, the hullabaloo died down, and D&D's been where it is since then. So that's all I've got to say today on page 121. I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for this look at the assassin. Um, and please leave me comments below, like the video if you would. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time on page 121.